one of those talks where I really wish I had PowerPoint working with me. Um, this talk, I will examine images of early Islamic history to determine its effects on the present and to demolish the past. Right? I'm afraid I'm going to have to launch into a lot of detail here, so I'm sorry I don't have time to explain all this or go, to, go into even more detail or to, to um, explain all the different um, dialogues I'm entering into. Um, as, I, as, as I was said, um, I'm summarizing 1300 years of Islamic history here, so I'll do my best. So why is Islamic history, and specifically Caliphate, um, so very important, right? Why is it so important? Um, because it affects the present. Um, Islamist groups of one sort or another, including ISIS, hark back to a supposedly perfect past. Um, but all societies will properly dealt with it, any other definition of perfect society is. They want to return in some form or another to the Caliphate, successors to the Prophet Muhammad, founder of the Islamic faith. And in, in doing so, they have helped create massive conflicts. Um, ranging from the, the rock, rock uh, jungles of cities of Iraq to Nigeria and Many of ISIS have strained the rules, um, such as specific taxation of Christians and slavery of Yazidis, is an attempt, however distorted, to return to what they see as the original Caliph. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about the historical Caliphate, and talk a little bit about what modern research has uncovered. Um, I hope everyone's still with me. The Caliphate started in 632 uh, CE or AD. The Caliph was the elected successor to, to the Prophet Muhammad, leading the, the um, community in both secular and religious matters, right? Um, the, the first Caliph was Abu Bakr, followed by Umar in 634 CE, Uthman in 644, and finally Ali in 656, who is regarded to some degree as a crucial figure in the foundation of the minority Shia faith. Um, the Caliphate co conquered most of the Middle East, um, taking advantage of, of the empires of the time, which had, which had very serious internal weaknesses, that is Byzantine, Byzantines and Sasanians, who had basically been fighting for about 600 years. Um, and they, the, cal the Caliphate's forces basically steamrolled over, over these weakened empires and managed to, to establish a new civilization. Um, the Umayyad dynasty from 661 C went on to conquer North Africa, Spain, and most of Central Asia as well. It was in turn overthrown by the Abbasid Caliphate in, six, or in 750. This, dy this dynasty greatly patronized the arts and with many new inventions ranging from algebra to the cam camera obscura, while successor dynasties in Andalusia, Spain, and elsewhere continued in this trend, at least for a while. However, the Caliphate became, became increasingly obsolete as the politics of the Muslim world changed around it, it its leaders becoming figureheads for a blur of different competing dynasties. Um, the, the Caliphate became a kind of banner to rally Muslims against outside aggression um, or internal decay, especially as the Muslim world um, began to decline in the face of competition from various um, civilizations. Eventually, um, the last caliphate, which was officially the Ottoman Empire, was extinguished in 1924 as Kemal, Kemal Ataturk um, turned, turned this remnant into a secular modern state. These figures and this history may seem increasingly obscure to many of you, okay? um, but in the Muslim world, are, these are really live issues. Okay? Figures like Umar, Uthman, Ali, these are constantly being renegotiated in movies, TV shows, and of course on the internet. Um, through a complex set of mnemonic catchphrases and easily me memorized stories and cliches about a golden ideal past which society is degraded away from. Um, it feeds into, co into the constant disruption in Muslims' lives brought about by, by foreign invasions, social pressures like overpopulation, and econo and economic stagnation, not to mention Western interventions. Um, and, and how Muslims see their history does affect politics nowadays. Okay, um, don't have more time to go into it to that, but it, but it does have a very real effect. Um, for instance, on the socio-economic policies of different countries ranging from Jordan to Egypt, to argue about different, different laws ranging from this period. Now, before we, we approach this, I'd like to say we're dealing with, any, anybody who's looking into scholarship in Islamic history, 
Islam in general has to deal with a massive amount of, of biases of one type or another, right? Even more so than in, than in most or many other subjects, right? Um, there's, we, we have a ma massive amount of, of, um, of uh, Orientalism, which is a series of cliches which have built up um, in the West about the Muslim world um, for the, about the last thousand years or so. And, and obviously, Muslims in return have a great, a great many cliches about the West. And this greatly hinders scholarship and greatly hinders dialogue between the two civilizations. To a great degree. And so, so this, and this is caused by, to, you know, in the modern era, by right wing groups of one sort or another, Salafi groups on, on the other hand. And this often causes trouble for trying to come up with at least, at least a, a little bit of objectivity in this knowledge. Now, of course, societies, religions, civilizations, ethnicities, and countries all across the world have images of their own history, usually with their particular in group being chosen in some way and with some specific birthright. Um, be it to land or to domination over, over others. Um, these images range from relatively innocuous ideas like the Irish nationalist movement or Islam's or Saints and scholars' ideas to more toxic ideas like the Aryan myth of Nazi Germany. In many cases, self-images self -images that are basically at variance with reality can tend to help cause real problems when dealing with people outside one's own perceived in -group. The West generally could be said to have these images. Look at the US's images of its own history, which has helped to drive many of its own questionable foreign policies, as in the Middle East. Um, these images help, helped oil seem to war, especially in times of extreme societal stress. Especially in times of extreme societal stress. This is quite important. As faced by the Sunni Muslims in the after the, the US invasion of Iraq, and of course the Jewish community, for instance, in 1945. Caught between extinction or, or carbon and planet for itself in Israel. This can cause communities to lash out, often in blind anger. But there's a complex interplay, and um, well, I'm not um, commenting on the, on the very real complexities behind all those different issues there. Um, there's a complex interplay here, and it does have real cons consequences for political events going on right now. On this slide. So was the Islamic age that golden? Well, sure, it has many achievements that Muslims can be justified and proud of. It's important to acknowledge this, from scholarship to the evangelism earlier. Um, but, for instance, was it a morally superior society, as so many of us suggest? Depending on how you define morality, even a belief in Islamic history can kind of tell you this is, this is not likely. Um, According to most Islamic historians of this period, including the renowned Quranic interpreter and historian Muhammad ibn Jarrah al Tabari, three out of four of the first caliphs were murdered, at least two by other Muslims, and at least two civil wars were fought within the caliphate's first 50 years. Another civil war involved the sack of Mecca in 683, when the Kaaba itself was burned. Bribery existed, many caliphs like Harun al Rashid drank wine, while the much maligned, much maligned wallet had drinking sessions in the, cell, in the central Islamic pilgrimage site. Prostitution did exist, this was much like the caliphate's contemporaries, the Tang Chinese, and predecessors like the Romans of Byzantine, where every barmaid was, a, was supposedly a prostitute. And virtually all civilizations, including modern Western and Muslim dominant men. Um, for instance, Tabari and more offhandedly the scholar, the scholar Baladuri notes that a major sex scandal rocked Basra when the local governor was caught with one of the women who sold her services to himself and other governors at the time. It seems there was a whole class of these, of these uh, women serving upper class individuals at the time. They eventually got off on a technicality of the witnesses argued about what I call they had seen as buttocks from. Um, there are other references, uh, but we simply don't know the extent of, of uh, prostitution for that matter. So many other um, socio-economic um, issues. Now, the dramatic increase in divorce um, in the past few decades in Europe, uh, is in, like Bahrain, has been associated with modernity. Yes, yes um, many pre-modern societies like Tokugawa, Japan, and Muslim lands in West Java and Malaysia had divorce rates as high as 70% in the same years. Um, while we still have limited data, we know divorce was common in the Abbasid dynasty, and many earlier public affairs did get divorces. Once again, all this may seem kind of irrelevant 
And um, when we look at court of biographical manuscripts for Aleppo, Cairo, and Damascus in the later Ottoman period, the records indicate that as many of the three Italian marriages ended in divorce and separation of one sort or another. Um, while some scholars believe it was not that good in the Russian period, like the what? documentation is that light like like complexion. Yeah. You're a moron. You can't help me. Sorry, sorry. I'm not going to be a moron. So anyway, according to what evidence we have, husbands didn't get on any better with the wife back then than they do now. Overall treatment of minority groups was probably good for its time and certainly far superior to Western Europe and even time to China. Though we must understand that by the, by the standards of 21st century Western Europe, treatment of minorities would be regarded as very poor with occasional pogroms as in Cordoba in 1011 and Granada in 1066. Arbitrary taxation, various social limitations, and the convivencia vaunted, vaunted by modern Islamist groups is not in any way constant. The rest of society and its expectations have basically moved on since then. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, is it possible that, that Islamists will one day be able to have a tolerable setup for its minority groups in a perfect Islamic state for women in this moral society they seek after? You know, it's possible, but is it ultimately likely that Islamist groups can deliver on this any time soon? Based on everything we've seen so far, um, based on their actual ability to govern, based on their education, their socioeconomic backgrounds, the fact that many of them have been traumatized by oppression or prosecution of their own, which after all is the main reason many of them do this. This has to be questioned critically. And it's important to approach this with a sense of proportion, while being balanced and informed, especially about Western history as well, and its very real effects on the Muslim world. Um, and it's not very easy looking at ourselves and you know, looking at our own self-image as well. Okay? Um, but the idea of the caliphate is the search for the perfect society I think we all want. Um, but the harsh society, or the harsh reality is that in, in the modern world, most attempts to resurrect any semblance of the historical caliphate, usually by force, have ended in chaos and failure. Um, like the, Sokot the Nigerian Sokotal Caliphate, which was defeated by the British in 1903, the Sudanese Mahdiya Caliphate collapsed in 1898, the off-sighted Ottoman Caliphate failing in 1924, the Sharifian Caliphate Hussein bin Ali, King of the Hijaz in 1924, and of course ISIS right now. Um, as with all other nationalisms, the very idea of simply transmogrifying a pre-modern civilization onto a modern society, it's, it's, it's foolish in the extreme. It's said that the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. Um, people in the past were alien, a fundamentally different um, social, economic and political background, completely different outlook on, on life. Um, most people were, were peasants tilling the land, with only a relatively small percentage of scholars or kings, um, which, in, which is the image which ne nevertheless survives to this day. Um, and as the saying goes, you can't go home again. The ideal image that is found of the caliphate never existed in the first place. It couldn't possibly be resurrected no matter how hard modern groups um, try. Just like most nationalist conceptions of the past, and it's best we, start, we all start looking objectively at our own history, at our own identity, and look instead to the future. Thanks. Um, the International Institute of Cyber Biotech in this year um, is going to tell us about biopharma. Good oh. question. So, hello everyone, I'm Prashant from ICPDC. So, I just want to have an idea how, much, how many biologists do we have in the I will totally ignore your questions. <laughs> so what I'm doing is I'm doing proteomics of the cells. So when you look at the central dogma of how a life structure works, it's the DNA to RNA to protein. So when we 
got to know about DNA, we got all excited and we started the genome sequencing that we, don't, we need to know what's written in DNA. So we did the genome project. And we hope to find every answer to that, but we didn't. Because DNA is an information repository. I'll tell somebody that's below me in a hierarchy to do something. The information is stored in a code. That's, it. that's DNA. But how the person is executing the job, it's very much depending on the person himself. And the personality and the activity of the person. And that's active people is for proteins in the living system. So I'm looking at how the proteins are functioning. And one way that they are functioning is, so presence of a protein is a different story than the activity of the protein. So how do we know the protein is present and it's active, or it's not active? So it's, it's done by, so activity of a protein is dependent on the post-translational modification that is on the protein. So I said post-translational, sorry for the term here, it's just that the modification that are done on a protein when it's synthesized, after it's synthesized. So they are totally activity related. So one of the frequent post-translational modifications is the phosphorylation. It's literally that a phosphate <coughs> or a phosphate group is attached to a protein, to a specific residue. So protein is made of polypeptides, and polypeptides like DNA, like alphabets, it's just a sentence of peptides, amino acids, sorry. So there are three amino acids, serine, theonine, and tyrosine, which are susceptible to phosphorylation. So just to give an example how protein is working, so there is a mechanism of lock and key, the protein. So if I, if I am a protein, and I have to attach, attach to another protein to make it active or reactive. I have to have some kind of a pattern that I tell him that, okay, I am your binding partner and then you bind to me. But I cannot just bind every time because that would create chaos in the system. The system cannot run at full potential every time, so it has to have a stop. And that stop is presented by the phosphorylation. So for example, phosphorylation, so if we imagine protein as a globular entity of peptides sticking together with the three-dimensional structure, a phosphate minority attached to a specific place would change the physical conformation of that space around the protein. So now the structure has changed. I had a structure A now, a phosphate has been attached to me, I have a structure B, which is compatible to the protein here. And now I have another site where the phosphorylation is attached, and now I have a structure C which is compatible to another protein. So it's very much dependent on where the phosphorylation is on a particular protein. Either it's deactivates or activates, that's another story. So you have DNA to RNA to protein. So typically when you study proteomics, you break open the cells and you literally just get a pool of proteins in your hand and you do mass spectrometric analysis. You degrade, you chop them out and you do a mass spectrometric But the phosphorylation is, is a, it's a reversible event. It goes and it comes. It goes, it's, it's highly regulated. It's, it's synchronized. So it's not a clear picture. So if you imagine it, like you are looking at a, at a cloud of fireflies and they are, they are, they are, they are flinting every time. They are, they, are, they are going on and off in a pattern. But they are, they are trying to send you a signal. So how hard it is to read that signal because you know, a lot of things are going on. And what I do is I get these fireflies like the proteins which are phosphorylated by chromatographic techniques. And then I do mass spec analysis on them. And in the end I get a list of proteins. But here is the tricky part. I do not do the phospho analysis on the proteins because it's not possible. It's not physically possible to analyze so many proteins from the sample in a mass spec. So I chop the proteins down into individual peptides of 15 amino acid long And then they are read by the mass spec from it. And which then I link back to the proteins which is a difficult task to do. And so once I have identified, for example, a very basic question would be, I have a cancer tissue and I have a normal tissue. And I did my phosphoproteomic analysis, I did my proteomic enrichment on them, and in the end I have a list of proteins that are highly phosphorylated in a cancerous tissue than a non-cancerous tissue. Then I need to make a biological sense of it. Just mere presence of phosphorylation does not tell that these proteins are more active in it. Then I have to read at what site the phosphorylation is. Is it as amino acid 4566, which is 
which lies in the hydrophobic region of the protein, or is it in the 334, which lies in whatever region, or it does not even matter. 70% of phosphorylation is constituted, it does not even matter. It does not have any functional role. So, it's kind of like breaking, going from DNA to RNA to proteins to being more specific to being more specific. So I'm at the stage that where I have, so as my uh, achievement so far, I'm in second year of my PhD here. So previously when we did that, these experiments and I, so we used to identify like around hundreds of phosphoproteins. So what we get this new kind of a workflow to enrich phosphoproteins, and now we are able to do thousand. But it, it's, I think it was it was a bad idea for me to do because I have to now analyze thousands of proteins instead of hundreds. So I'm I'm kind of I want to use this platform also as to reach out to you guys if anybody has any knowledge in our statistical program. <laughs> anybody <laughs> please? <laughs> because I'm literally banging my head on the table from my week already. And I'm able to put a line it up so far, <laughs> but it's not enough. So if anybody has knowledge in that, please, please help me. So yeah, the, so as Peter said, I'm working in biopharmaceutical cells. I gave an example of cancer because everybody, cancer, it's interesting. <laughs> so what I'm doing is, there are Chinese hamster ovary cells, which are used to protein bio, produce biopharmaceutical products. But we need to, as any industry, we need to increase the output of those proteins. So we have to make super producers. We have to eliminate the bottleneck that are present in those cells. Like they cannot grow that high density or they die early, apoptosis, they degrade the proteins. So we need to improve those cells. One way is looking to improve those cells is to look in the biology of understanding how these cells are actually behaving in a in a bioreactor. So I'm taking the cells from bioreactor and I'm doing my phosphoproteinic analysis on them. And I would see how the signaling patterns on the cell in an ideal world are working. So basically it's a cloud of fireflies and I'm taking photos at a particular time. I take snapshots, 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 and I'm overlaying all the snapshots and I see which fireflies it is blinking at what time and trying to make a sense of it. Not successful. So. <laughs> Any questions? That's good. From the biologist? <laughs> no. <I'm good. laughs> So, what are you doing for the omics um, on things in bioreactors comparing them to what they'd be like normally in culture or something? So, or? this is this is something that if I have to study a pond, I cannot just look at the pond. Yeah. I have to create some disturbance in it. So, what I do is in industry there is a so industry just focuses on improving the productivity. And somebody was trying to do cultures at different times, and they said at 31 degrees Celsius instead of 37, which is a normal body temperature of the mammal, the cells are producing more protein. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a very normal idea or a proof of concept study for me would be to differentiate how the phosphorylation of these cells work at 31 then to 30. What pathways are activated at 31 then to 37. So I can do a drug response, what drug is altering what pathways, for example. Oh, very good. Is all the comparison happening through like analytic software? Is that how you do these continuous comparisons? It's so there are different types of studies you can do. Like you can label your proteins. So for example, I have two samples group here, cancerous and non-cancerous. But how do I know how much is in one and how much is in another? So there are many studies. You can put a, a known amount of a label. For example, a radioactive P53 or whatever the compound is and then you normalize the abundance of <coughs> protein X to the, the protein that you have supplied and you know the value of that. I do a label free study, there are no labels, so there is no limitation to how many protein axes that you can do. So it's a label free, but at the sample preparation step, I have to be careful the protein that goes into my mass spec is, is same, the amount is same. So the amount that's only differing is the biological amount of an activity, not the sample preparation amount. <coughs> Are you trying to develop a new technique then to analyze this? Is this like, as I mean, I've done this, or is this like what you're saying, you're trying to get a specific time where you've seen those flashes so you can go, right, I mean, wants to go identify or look at this, because so as I said, there's millions or thousands of different phosphates and different different proteins. So, and you said you got thousands of different samples, like, so that's too much information to actually really do. So are you just trying to identify a technique that other people then can take forward? 
or are you actually trying to get a specific mechanism that's happening that you want them to use for growth? So the thing is, so another limitation of this, then, and I will come back to this question again. Another limitation is that when you do a chromatographic enrichment, you do not get all the phosphorylation varieties that are in there. So there is a limitation. So yes, I'm trying to develop a technique which has no limitations, or, or improving that I get 90% of phosphorylation, or I get 95% of phosphorylation. Apart from that, for a biological science and for the sake of my PhD, I just want to identify some key, as you say them as biomarkers, some key proteins or phosphoproteins which I can target by SIRNA knockdown or CDNA or expression to improve the improve the productivity of the cells, which are essential for the product formation, for the sake of PhD, but for the longer term, yes, it's, it's yeah, like to improve the, the techniques that's already there. Sorry, just out of curiosity, are you working for a specific pharmaceutical company, or is yours academic still? It's, it's just academic. It's still academic. So you will soon be bought over by pharmaceutical <laughs> <laughs> The reason is, please don't hit me. Because as I say pharmaceutical, I'm on your side. <laughs> the reason is, if I make a cell, or we are like actually a group of 15 people from all around the places, if we make a technique or a cell that is able to produce more protein in the same amount of resources, you're going to get cheap medicine. Sure. We're going to get more profits. <laughs> Just out of interest, uh, what method of ionization do you use in this spec? It's a ESI. ESI. Yeah, okay. ESI. Yeah. Nano ESI. Yes. Do you do a lot of mass spec as well? Uh, yeah, we just based mass spec, yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Is, is it just phosphorylation states you look at? Just phosphorylation states. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Any more questions? Yeah, uh, how do you, so when you take this snapshot of the chromatograph, how do you count the, the protein? Or you, you now, this is the thing. Are you doing image processing or is it just how you count it automatically? No, no, it's, it's, not even, it's just for the visualization okay. that I, I paint yeah, this yeah. picture. I'm, I paint the picture in my head to kind of understand how it, it, it goes. In the end, I get a list of proteins. From sample A to sample B, 1,000 proteins phosphorylated, down phosphorylated at condition A, up phosphorylated at condition B. Then there are fancy pathway softwares that you can put them into, and they would say these protein might be active because they are involved in mTOR signaling pathway. But it's, to be honest, I find it quite vague. And, and this is the, so I cannot get my head around which I primarily think as vague, so I have to write my transfer thesis by next week, so please help me. <laughs> <laughs> Should not be here. <laughs> Thanks, Krishna. Thank you. So just before I start, um, thanks all for coming, it's a great crowd, I wasn't expecting this. I only printed out one copy of these things, so this <laughs> might take a time to get around the room. So uh, I'm absolutely happy to take questions whenever and on whatever you have, as long as on the topic, of course. <laughs> um, so as, as Peter just said earlier on, I do settlement patterns in Ireland, specifically in the Diocese of Tume. If you don't know where that is, this is the map. Um, and there it was in Ireland, it's the parts of Mayo and Galway, also parts of Roscommon. Um, it's on the periphery of, of even now, but also in the medieval, la medieval times, it is, it is the least known about province of, of Ireland. But uh, this is why I kind of chose to, chose to do the topic. So, I'm going to pass that around, so if you have any questions, just add it around. So when most people think of the medieval times, this is a, this is a scene from the Vikings. Um, maybe most people think of Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones. When I think of the Vikings, and as they often get things right and they often get things wrong. The reason why I chose this is this is um, a Christian monk who was taken by the Vikings from Lindisfarne back to Scandinavia. And in that time he kind of has a... I not say that's the right word. He kind of has a, a, a struggle within himself between um, the Christian religion that he's used to 
and the pagan religion that he has come into. So he he has so he becomes almost a, a jewel. He almost he he almost becomes Christian, but also pagan at the same time. And this is a this is a this is a, a dichotomy that that's that that you find true when you look at conversion studies. If you look at sources like you know whether it's within Islam or whether it's you know the, the patrician text about Saint Patrick, you would reckon that you know that someone turned up to a land and snapped their fingers and everyone becomes the religion of the country that they're in. But that's never that that's never the case. So our problem in Ireland, of course, is that the majority of the texts that we have are written by Christians, monks, ecclesiastics, and they of course have their own biases to how they write history. So how do we look at the process of conversion in Ireland? Well, one of the easiest ways that people look at it in Anglo-Saxon England, in Francia, and throughout the world is through burial practices. As well, I mean. it's a nice picture. Um, <laughs> But our main problem is that Irish burial practices change about 200 years even before the coming of Christianity to Ireland. So in most places, Anglo-Saxon England and in Scandinavia with the Vikings, you find burial goods, weapons, uh, things that they would have traded with. Whereas in Ireland you don't find that at all. We start to use the burial practices of Christianity before Christianity comes. So, uh, graves are aligned east-west, there are no, uh, no grave goods, and that makes it very difficult to date these uh, graves to either being pagan or Christian. And in the patrician text, so the text about St. Patrick, those texts that many of you would have done in, in primary school and have long since forgotten, um, he deals the, the two main tradition text uh, authors, uh, Chirekon and Muraku, both deal with it in very different ways. Muraku, who tends to be the one that's 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 focused on for for primary school and, and uh, stories, is, is the one who is much more of a, of a zealot. He talks of how, like how um, Patrick basically comes in and and basically almost eviscerates the, the, the pagan way of burial entirely. Chirakon himself is much more on the fence. He, he understands that it's not so much about taking out the practices as, as Christianizing them. And as we can see that from last Sunday, which is Greek Sunday, where everyone goes up for Patrick, which has nothing to do with St. Patrick, because St. Patrick's Day is of course the 7th of March, but it has to do with the the pre-Christian idea of lunacy to do with the harvest. So it has to do with the god Lu. So that in itself is a way that um, that we've Christianized a, a pre-Christian thing. And this here is just a quote about something else that you're going to say. So, how then do we do it? And I saw that one of the former the people who had pulled out was doing something on psychology, so I decided to put this in. The way that some people have now begun to do it is using cognitive analysis. And they've begun to do the archaeology of the near-death experience. So, what they've done is they've looked at this uh, database called Enderf, and I would recommend everyone to go on because there are some very interesting stories and, uh, and uh, things of near-death experiences. And what they found was that those who weren't, um, they, they, didn't, that they were either atheists or didn't know if there was a god, tended to find that their kind of near the experiences tended to be along rivers or on high places or along roadways. Now whatever the, the actual um, reason for that is, it, it's up for debate. But if you look at Roman or Greek or other places, that, other pagan places, a lot of their, um, a lot of their uh, grave sites and burial sites tend to be along these kind of places. Um, and I, I apologize for I don't know why I hand these out, but okay. Um, so these are terrible, terrible photos and I apologize for the quality. But the one on the left is a is a Roman mausoleum from the uh, on the Via Appia going to Rome. So one of the main routeways uh, going into the Roman city. And the right is the River Styx, the kind of the Greek 
so the, the, so this imagery is not only found in these in, uh, by modern people, but it's also the the, the uh, representation that we've had from ancient times. Um, so, as yeah, I mean, this is a bit stop start. So I, I just I just took some pieces from different papers, and I thought they were interesting. So, as anyone from Ireland will know, farming is very important in Ireland, um, and this period is one of ch severe change. For from about 300 BC to about 300 AD, we have a complete drop off to negligible levels of pollen of cultivable cultivable crops. For whatever reason, we don't know. Comparably, this is a time in Roman Gaul and in Britain where there's an economic boom. So the, there is no, there doesn't seem to be a climatic reason for this for the drop off. But within 50 years, between about 250 AD and 300 AD, all across the country, from Tipperary and Mayo across the east and the north, there tends there, there's a massive boom back up, and it's completely and totally impossible to know why, to discern why. And we probably will never know because we don't have any sources for that period from Ireland. So this here is a, is a pollen, uh, it's, it, it's actually much easier to read than, than it looks from first viewing. Um, this is also in colour, in, but uh, my printer in the office doesn't do colour. No, it's black and white. So, um, you will be able to see that here, the cultivatable crops have declined, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a spike again. This here is to do with the foundation of Mayo Abbey. Now, Mayo Abbey is an interesting site that not many people know of, even within the academic world. It was a monastery founded by Anglo-Saxons, people from England, people that were, had left England due to a, a fight that they had with the, the church there. Um, and the church, of course, is a very important um, bringer of change, both with it, with obviously with Christianity, but also with writing and agricultural produce. They also were probably the main instigators behind the use of horizontal water mills, which allowed more produce, which would probably was due to the demographic increase, population increase, and um, metalworking and industry in, the, in this period is that the limitations placed on it by communications, so but the fact that there weren't many good roads, and we have to waterland way, waterways, and the fact that <coughs> the majority of people would have been involved in agriculture and therefore would have also limited the number of people in uh, industry <coughs> meant that for uh, for the early part of this period, at least, metalworking was a very liminal. Around water, they seem to have some sort of uh, quasi-mystical kind of uh, element to them. That they, they're almost like, uh, a med like an, an early medieval version of a guild trying to protect its secrets. But you see this in, in other cultures as well. Uh, in Greece, Hephaestus, the god of smithing, it has has its stability. In in uh, in Norse mythology, the dwarves, and also in Lord of the Rings, also the dwarves. Discovered during the, uh, the the Celtic Tiger boom, of course, as many things were. Um, it's, a, it's a it's a ring port site. Um, there are four different areas of metalworking, and there was one and a half tons of iron slag taken out of this site, which is a lot. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the iron. I'm actually going to talk about this, which this is actually the one that I really want to be in colour because that's gold. That's a piece of gold filigree the size of a two cent coin. And there's a representation that uh, Neve Whitfield has done of a reconstruction of it. So, that this site may have been using, there, there is no other reference to metalworking on this site. Doesn't mean that there weren't there, that the site has been used for agriculture for many, many years and it may have been brought away. So now I pass it up? Oh, sorry. Can I just throw it? So there's that. So, on top here you have the original low part piece. On the bottom, what you have is a representation of a piece found on a site in County Meath in the Gorkrono in the 1920s and 30s by Hugh Henkin and his Harvard team. 
And as you see, there's a, there's a massive similarity between the two. And there are many reasons that, that they could have a similarity. Either that these, this, this style is more common than we know now, and that it, it just, the rest of the gold got melted down and it's not there anymore. Either there was an uh, itinerant work craftsman who was moving from place to place, uh, or that there was a metal worker somewhere in between the two, maybe in Comic Noise, that was doing both and just selling them on both sides, or possibly gift exchange. The, the possibilities are endless, uh, and that's kind of part of the problem. problem. Um, but yeah, so I mean, <coughs> we have these changes, and like as I as I said in the first and the second slide about like about changes that the conversion was definitely much slower than than, than what people have, have thought of in the last 50, 60 years, particularly with you know the the, the, the national myth of the Christian Irish farmer that's always been here, even before Patrick apparently. Um, and it's interesting now that in the Kelly Tiger, that, that uh, Kelly Tiger, and a lot of this great that hasn't been published yet, that, that a lot of those um, myths that have been that have kind of permeated through academia and through the, the popular imagination of the last like hundred years are beginning to be uh, felt. So uh, yeah, let's be done, I suppose. Great.